Hello all, in this video I'm going to be giving an outline of what you can expect from an Oxford Physics undergrad interview, and some details about my own interviews. On that last point, I won't be revealing the exact questions I was asked at my main interview in college, which was University College, in fairness to the tutors that set them. But for my second interview in college, I can be a little bit more specific about the details of questions, but in fairness to those interviewers, I won't be revealing which college was my second interview in college. So as you probably know, when you apply to Oxford, you can either apply to a specific college or submit an open application where a college allocation is made for you. Now there's no downside to doing an open application. Colleges don't know which students have applied to them directly and which have been allocated to them by an open application. After you've sat the pack in November, colleges will review your entire UCAS application and your PAP score and decide whether or not to invite you to interview. These decisions are usually sent out around the end of November, beginning of December, for interviews to take place in mid-December. If you're invited to interview, you can expect to be in Oxford for two to three days, where your main interview in college will provide for you free meals and accommodation, uh, and will also organise various social things for you to get to know other interviewees. Most colleges will interview their students more than once, but this depends on the college and its subject. Also, you're guaranteed at least one further interview at a second college, which can help take off some of the pressure if you don't think you performed at your best in one of your earlier interviews. The thing to be aware of right from the start is that Oxford interviews are not like most job interviews, they're academic interviews. The bulk of the interview is going to involve tutors asking you academic questions about your chosen subject. The point of the interviews is for tutors to see how you respond to looking at familiar material in unfamiliar context to mimic the tutorial side of teaching at Oxford. Typically, these interviews last around 20 minutes. You can expect when you enter the room to be greeted by two to three academics seated at a table. There may be some brief pleasantries, perhaps even a handshake if there's no global pandemic. But then pretty quickly, the interview will get down to the bulk of the content, which will be the subject material. Sometimes tutors will ask you something about what you've written in your personal statement. So it's very important to be aware of the kind of things you've talked about and be comfortable in discussing in some detail any of the topics you've mentioned in your personal statement. When tutors are asking you questions, you'll either be sat opposite them on the other side of a table working on paper, or asked to stand at a whiteboard to show you're working for them while they ask you questions seated. This probably wouldn't apply to an essay subject like English or history, but for physics this is certainly the case. If you get stuck on a question or start going down the wrong route, the tutors will give you a prompt to get you back on track. They aren't expecting you to whiz through everything with no problems at all or not need to clarify anything with them. They're looking to see how you respond to prompts when you do get in, uh, encounter something that's difficult, as you will do frequently if you're studying a degree in physics. This general format holds for most interviews, but some colleges do do some things a little bit different. At my college, University College, for example, the year I was interviewed, we were interviewed twice. One of the traditional formats that I've just described and a second interview where we were given an envelope with three longer answer questions in and asked to prepare one of them uh, in our own time, sort of in a, in a in a few hours, to then present to the tutors during the interview. I think this is a good way of doing things because it gives students the opportunity to uh, work on a difficult problem and explain their working in a slightly less uh, time sensitive and pressurised context, which some people certainly struggle with. Like I mentioned earlier, my main college for interviews and the place I've spent the last four years was University College. In fairness to my tutors there, I'm not going to give the exact questions I was asked in my interviews, but rather some edited versions that capture the gist of those questions. So let's talk about my first interview at UNIV. The first question I was asked at UNIV concerned the following setup. We have two fixed charges, both with charge positive big Q, separated by a distance 2D, and in between them, we have a uh, free movable charge, positive small q. And the first thing I was asked to do was to find the force on this middle charge as a function of the middle charge's displacement on the midpoint of the two fixed charges. So this is quite a straightforward application of Coulomb's law, the inverse square law. So first, we'll find the force due to the left fixed charge. Now all these charges are positive, so all the forces involved will be repulsive. 
and we choose to take the right direction as our positive direction. In, as in all distances to the right of the midpoint we measure as positive and all forces directed to the right we measure as positive as well. So due to the left hand fixed charge, the first term we have from Coulomb's law is as follows, where the distance between the left charge and the middle charge is d plus x, as we can see from the diagram. And now due to the right charge, we again have a repulsive force, but now the force is, uh, is acting to the left. So this has a minus sign based on our direction convention. And now the distance is d minus x. So this is the expression we have for the force, which we can neaten up just a little bit, as will be useful later. The second thing I was asked to do was to sketch the potential energy of the middle charge little q as a function of its displacement from the middle. So in order to do this, we need to know the formula uh, for the potential energy of a charge q1, which, uh, of a charge little q, let's say, uh, in the field of a charge big Q, which is as follows. So this would look like charge q here, separated by distance r, from charge small q. So for our setup, we again just need to add up the potential energy contribution from the left fixed charge and the one from the right fixed charge. So we have V is equal to big Q little q over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over D plus x from the left charge, and then from the right charge. d minus x, which again we neaten up very slightly as follows. Now to sketch this, we can first look for the simple parts uh, that we can draw on immediately. So uh, when x is zero, we notice that this has a finite positive value, which it doesn't really matter what it is, but it'll be um, qq over 2 pi epsilon naught d. And we also notice that at positive d and negative d, we'll have some odd asymptotic behavior, as we'll be dividing by something that approaches zero. So let's take a look first at what happens as we approach positive d from the left hand side. Now as we approach positive d from the left hand side, the term that will dominate will be this right term in the expression. Now when x is less than d, so when we're approaching from the left hand side, d minus x will be positive. Uh, and as it gets closer and closer, as x gets closer and closer to d, the denominator will get closer and closer to zero, so the whole expression will get closer and closer to positive infinity. So we have some behavior like this, where the curve will approach the asymptote at positive d. And now if we look at approaching the negative d asymptote from the right hand side, we have the same kind of thing where the curve approaches the negative d asymptote at, towards positive infinity from the right hand side. And then the other sides are less important um, outside of positive d and negative d, but they will look like this as a kind of standard um, reciprocal curve. So that is what the potential looks like. The next thing I was asked to do was to write an expression for the force on q when the displacement x is much, much smaller than the separation between the charges 
D or, or 2D is the separation between the charges, but the factor of 2 doesn't actually matter. So in order to do this, we're going to use the binomial expansion formula that we should all know. Uh, to make this simpler, I've rewritten f of x in this more suggestive form. So we know that if we have something like 1 plus y to the power of n, this is expanded as a binomial series as 1 plus ny plus n, n minus 1 over 2 y squared plus higher order terms, y cubed, and so on and so forth. And we also know that if y is very small, this is approximately equal to 1 plus ny. To make use of this, um, we have to write d plus x to the minus 2 and d minus x to the minus 2 in the form of 1 plus something. So to do this, we can take the d outside of the bracket such. And now we can see that this is approximately equal to, using the binomial expansion formula on this term, 1 minus 2 x over d. And likewise, for d minus x to the minus 2, this is approximately equal to d to the minus 2, 1 plus 2, x over d. So now we can put this all together into the formula for f as a function of x, and we find f of x is equal to minus big Q little q over 2 pi epsilon naught 1 over d cubed times x. So that is the force uh, on the middle charge when the displacement is very small. So the final question is now, what kind of motion will this particle undergo if we displace it a very small amount from the center? So back to the expression we had for the force, this is exactly uh, the kind of form we would expect uh, from simple harmonic motion. So the force acting on the object is, in the, is, is proportional to the displacement away from the center and is directed in the opposite direction to it. So this tells us that when the displacement is small, we can expect the, the charge in between to oscillate with simple harmonic motion, which makes a lot of sense. Um, if you think we have a positive charge here, if we displace it slightly to the right, we'll now be closer to the right-hand charge, so there'll be a greater repulsive force pushing us to the left, and so on. Uh, so the charge will then accelerate to the left, will then be further to the left-hand side, and then will be pushed back towards the centre by the left-hand charge. We can also see this by looking at the potential energy curve we drew earlier. Um, when you have a, a curve for potential energy, you can imagine uh, if you place a ball somewhere on the curve, the motion that the ball would undergo if you you know, if you build a, a ramp for this, this shape of the potential energy curve, that can also tell you what the motion will be like. So we can see if we placed a ball in this, in a bowl, the shape of this curve, it would oscillate backwards and forwards in this potential well. So that is the kind of motion this particle will undergo. Uh, and that is an example of the first interview question I was asked at University College. The second question in this interview was a little shorter and less calculation heavy. I was described the problem of two stacked balls dropped from a height h with the lighter ball on the top and the heavier ball on the bottom. The question was, what will happen to the smaller ball once the balls hit the ground? Will it return to height h? Will it go higher or will it stay above h? Importantly, throughout this question, we can assume perfectly elastic collisions, which makes all of the things we have to do a lot easier. The answer becomes pretty clear when we draw out the three stages of the ball's collision with the ground and then with each other. Immediately before the more massive ball hits the ground in the first picture, 
both balls move downwards with some speed v, which we calculate from conservation of uh, potential to kinetic energy, but we don't actually have to here. After the large ball bounces off the ground in picture two, assuming a perfectly elastic collision, it now moves upwards towards the smaller ball with speed v. Now, this relies on there being a very slight separation between the two balls before they hit the ground, so the larger ball has time to flip direction before the smaller ball. But it turns out even with negligible separation, this model is very good, so we don't need to worry too much about this detail. From picture two, it's now pretty clear that the collision of the two balls will impart more momentum to the smaller ball than it initially had before the collision. So as shown in picture three, the smaller ball will move upwards with some speed greater than v, and will therefore go beyond the initial height h. The larger ball, however, will move up with speed less than v, so will not reach the height h it was dropped from, so the two balls will separate. We could work out the exact height the smaller ball would reach by doing some elastic collision calculations, conserving momentum and energy, but it wasn't necessary for this fairly qualitative question. The follow-up to this could be, what about if the heavier ball is now on top? Will the how will the balls uh, move now? If we look at picture one here, we can see that the smaller ball will not impart enough momentum to the larger ball to reverse its direction, in contrast to the previous case. What will happen now is that the smaller ball will become sandwiched between the larger ball on top and the ground, and then the two balls will bounce up together, each with speed v. Therefore, in this setup, the two balls will bounce back together, not separated, to the same height they were initially dropped from. As I mentioned earlier, my college also gave us an envelope with three longer answer questions where we could choose one question to go and work on unsupervised for a few hours and then present in an interview. Here is a question that's quite similar to the one I chose to answer from those given in that envelope. So in this question, we are given a bowl formed from uh, a parabola of revolution. So that's a paraboloid uh, formed by taking a parabola and rotating it about its symmetry axis. This tank is then filled with water from the top at a constant rate R1, so R1 units of volume per second. Uh, we're told that the tank is empty initially, and we want to find the height of the water level at some time later after the, the water has been poured in. So the first thing we need to do is we want to find the volume of this paraboloid uh, up to some certain height d. So then what we can do is we can equate the total volume of this uh, section of the paraboloid with the volume of water which has flowed in in some time t. So the method for doing this is the standard uh, volume of revolution calculation. So it involves summing up lots of these infinitesimally thin circular disks, which have some thickness dy, and each have an area, uh, so this is r, the area will be pi r squared. But of course here r, this is, is would be x here, rather. So the integral we want to do up to depth d, is pi times x squared, so that's the area of one of those little disks multiplied by the thickness of one of these tiny disks. But of course we have, actually we are told what the equation for the side profile of the paraboloid looks like. So the parabola we've revolved in order to make this bowl uh, just has the equation y equals x squared. So we have y equals x squared Therefore, the integral becomes integral between 0 and d of pi y dy, which just goes to half pi d squared. So this is the volume of this uh, section here of the paraboloid. And now we know that the we, we now want to equate this volume with the total volume of water that's flown in. So that is r1 times t is equal to half pi d squared, which we can arrange to rearrange uh, in terms of a function for d as a function of t 
2 r1 over pi square rooted times the square root of t. And now lastly, we want to sketch this function uh, for the depth with respect to time. And that looks like a parabola on the side. Now, for the second part of this question, we have a cylindrical tank. Uh, we're told that initially uh, the tank is at some filled to some water level d naught, and then we cut a hole in the side of the tank. Uh, this hole is height h above the base of the tank, and we want to find how long it'll take for the tank to drain and the water level to come down to the level of the hole. So the first thing we want to do is find the velocity of the water flowing out of the tank when the tank water level is at some depth d. Uh, the best way to do this is to use conservation of energy. So you can see in red we have a pressure force which is forcing water to come out of the tank due to the difference between the pressure inside of the water tank and the atmospheric pressure outside of the water tank. So applying conservation of energy we can write that this force that is acting on this element of the fluid, uh, force being pressure times area, so we have to multiply by the area A of the, the hole, forces it the element across a distance dl, so this is force times distance, it's the work done, and this is equal to the kinetic energy gained by the fluid element, which we've given a mass m, where the mass m is given by this expression. This is just volume the volume of the fluid element times by the density of the fluid. We can now also say that the pressure inside of the tank will be equal to the atmospheric pressure outside of the tank plus this expression rho g d minus h which accounts for the weight of the fluid uh, above the hole increasing the pressure. This is a, a sort of standard standard formula for pressure at a, a given depth um, in some fluid of density rho. So if we put this in now, using the, new, the expression we have for rho 1 into our conservation of energy equation, the left hand side becomes this, and the right hand side, now plugging in the expression for mass we have for the fluid element, is as follows. And now we can cancel various terms here and rearrange for v, finding that the velocity of the fluid leaving the hole will be root 2g d minus h. So this is the velocity of the fluid leaving the hole. Uh, and now if we want to find the amount of fluid, the volume of fluid that leaves in a single second, this will be given by v times a. This is the, the volume of fluid that passes through the hole per second. And now from the conservation of uh, the fluid volume, the amount of fluid that leaves has to be equal to minus the rate of change in the volume of the fluid. Now we have a cylindrical tank with radius r, and at some time t it will have depth d, so the volume of this blue portion of liquid is pi r squared d, and pi and r squared are just constants, so the derivative moves through like this. And now if we plug in the expression we derived earlier for v, we can set up this differential equation we'd like to solve. And solving this is not too hard, uh, it uses the standard uh, separation of variables integration technique. So if we bring all the things with d to one side, we end up with dd over d minus h square rooted is equal to minus a over pi r squared root 2g dt, just putting all the constants uh, with the t side of things. And then as we usually would do, we can now integrate both sides of this equation to get rid of the differential part and we find we have 2 d minus h square rooted is equal to minus a over pi r squared 
root 2 g t plus some integration constant. And then we can use the initial conditions we are told that at t equals 0, the depth has some constant value d0 to find that c must be 2 d0 minus h. And now we want to find the time it takes for the water level to go down to h. So this is the height the hold is at. So we want to find time such that d equals h. So now we just plug in uh, d equals h into our expression here, where we also now know c from here. And this gives us the result that t is equal to pi r squared over a times 2 d naught minus h over g, all square rooted. The interview at my second college consisted of a larger number of shorter questions compared to my interview at uni, so let's take a look at those now. OK, this question was the first question I was asked at my second interview in college, and it's a pretty uh, classic one that's asked a lot, uh, I think. And it also came along with a very good piece of advice by the tutor. When I first sat down after, you know, saying hello and how was the journey, where have you come from, etc. Uh, the tutor said, now if, you, if we ask you a question that you've already seen before, tell us you've already seen it. Don't try and trick us and pretend you've not seen it before and like you just know how to get it quite easily. Uh, because we'll know. And that is very good advice because the tutors do generally know. You know, a lot of them have been interviewing people uh, quite a bit for some of them before the students they're interviewing were born. So they've seen a lot of students come through. And the best advice certainly is if you've seen a problem before, tell them that you've seen it. And in this case, this was a problem I had seen before, but I thought I'd talk about it anyway, as it is quite a nice one and a very quick one. So the question is to differentiate with respect to x, the expression y equals x to the power of x. And this is one of those ones that when you see the trick, you know it again, but the first time you see it, you do have to think about it a little bit. So we know quite easily how to differentiate things like e to the power of x, or x to the power of uh, some uh, constant, but x to the x doesn't really fit into any of those categories. So the, the, the best thing to do is to think about how we can turn x to the x into some exponential function. So the, the way to do this is to write x to the x as e to the power of natural log of x to the x, because of course the exponential cancels the logarithm here. And then we can use our log identities to write log of x to the x as x log of x, and now differentiating this with respect to x, we're just using the product rule and the chain rule. So we have the derivative of what is in the exponent x log of x times e x log of x. So the derivative of the exponent, first we can differentiate the x term and we just get a 1. So that becomes natural log of x plus, and then we differentiate the second term, leaving the first term alone. So this becomes x over x, so that is 1, and that's all times e to the x log of x, which we know is x to the x. So that is the diff uh, derivative of x to the x. The next question I was asked in this interview, the tutor pulled out a ruler. He pulled out a beta ruler though, but I only have a 30 centimeter ruler. And he said, if he balances the ruler between each of his fingers and then begins to move his fingers inwards together, what will happen to the ruler? Will it unbalance? Will it fall off? What will happen? So I said that I thought his fingers would meet in the middle and the ruler would stay balanced. And as we can see, That is in fact what happens. He then asked whether there would be any difference if he kept his left finger still and moved his right finger inwards or vice versa. And I said there wouldn't be any difference. And we can see keeping my left finger still 
this is still the case. And then we of course have to explain why this happened. So if you consider the ruler on my two fingers, there are two pivots here. Now, when I start to move my right finger inwards, I'm exposing more ruler on this right side than was initially there. And this extra weight on the right side acts to give a turning force, which wants to rotate the ruler counterclockwise. So when there's this additional moment counterclockwise, it reduces the reaction force on my left finger. And when the reaction force on my left finger is reduced, there's less friction between uh, the ruler and my left finger. So as I'm moving it inwards, it means it's easier now for the ruler to slide over my left finger. So you can see this kind of creates a sort of um, self-correcting mechanism, whereby when I move the right finger inwards, the reaction force on the left finger is reduced, causing the ruler to slide more easily over the left finger, and vice versa. Then when the left finger uh, gets more ruler on its side, on the left, that reduces the reaction force on the right finger, meaning the ruler can then slide more over to the right finger. So whatever we do, the ruler remains pretty balanced, however we draw our fingers together. To begin this question, the tutor asked me to explain why it is helium balloons float. So I went ahead and explained that from Archimedes' principle, we know that the uh, weight of air that's displaced by a helium balloon is equal to the upthrust that is generated uh, by its presence in the air. And then because helium is less dense than air, the weight of the balloon is not enough to counter the upthrust. So the upthrust created by the displaced weight of the air in the atmosphere is greater than the weight of the balloon. So that causes the balloon to float. So then the tutor asked, OK, well, how do you explain Archimedes' principle? So to explain Archimedes' principle, we can look at the second diagram and uh, without deriving it exactly, um, which isn't too hard either, we can say that the pressure at the bottom of the balloon is higher than the pressure at the top of the balloon. And this is because in the atmosphere, um, the air gets thinner as you, you go higher up. Uh, this is because if you imagine at each uh, layer of the Earth's atmosphere, the pressure at that layer has to support all of the weight of the, the, the air on top of it. So the lower down you go towards the Earth, the more air you have on top uh, from that layer. So there you, fall. you have to have a higher pressure in order to support the weight of the air on top of you. So if there's a higher pressure at the bottom and a lower pressure at the top, that generates an upthrust. And Archimedes' principle is the statement that the magnitude of that upthrust is equal to the, the weight of the air you displace by the, the presence of the, in this case, the balloon. The next question the tutor asked uh, was a setup. If you tie a helium balloon to the floor of a car and the car then accelerates forwards, he wanted to know what I thought would happen to the helium balloon. Would it swing backwards or something else? So, I mean, I hadn't seen this problem before, so my instinctive uh, answer was I thought the balloon would swing backwards, as you would do. You know, when you're accelerating on a train, uh, you, you feel yourself pushed back into your seat if you're facing forwards. You know, you feel the acceleration in the opposite direction to the acceleration. But actually, this isn't the case in this problem. Uh, and it's quite interesting. And you can look up all sorts of YouTube videos of people doing this experiment and seeing it happen. So we established from Archimedes principle that uh, if you have a gravitational field like the Earth, where you have a higher pressure closer to the Earth and a lower pressure further away from the Earth because of the different layers of the atmosphere having to support more weight on top of them if you're lower down towards the Earth. Now, when the car is accelerating forwards, um, there you can't actually tell the difference between an acceleration and a gravitational field. So if you're in a lift, for example, if the lift is uh, accelerating upwards, you, you don't really have any way of telling, I mean, it's a bit of a silly, silly thought, but you don't really have any way of telling whether you're accelerating upwards or whether you're just in a stronger gravitational field than you were beforehand. 
though of course you know you're accelerating upwards because the earth didn't suddenly get more massive um so if you add the acceleration to of the car to the gravitational field you get a kind of effective gravitational field that is felt by anyone in the car uh, including the balloon so when you add these this has the effect of changing the direction slightly of the gravity felt by the balloon or you know what you could feel as gravity but is also the acceleration of the car and this is now in a downwards diagonal direction and we know that if a balloon uh, is being held still on the earth it'll point upwards away from the center of the earth so when we have this kind of effective direction of the gravitational force the balloon points in the opposite direction to it so we can see that when the car is accelerating forwards the balloon actually also swings forwards which is quite an interesting result and not necessarily what you'd first expect looking at this problem so those were my oxford physics interview questions or at least the ones i can still remember i hope you found this video useful if you have, please think about subscribing. And if you also haven't already, take a look at my website, cosmicconundra.com, for some more resources. And also follow Cosmic Conundra on Twitter. All the information is in the, in the, thing, uh, the thing below the video. Um, the, the description. Yeah, so take a look at that. Okay, thank you very much. See you all soon.